Sabbath shalom, brethren. Peace and the grace of Jesus Christ, the Father and the Spirit be upon you as we kneel in prayer to start the morning devotion. Let's pray. Holy, wonderful, and loving divine nature, God who is, is revealed in the persons of the Father, the Word, our Savior Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of Truth. We thank you, Lord, for being alive and well and in our right mind that we can come to exalt your name and to glorify you on a day that you have set apart so that we can experience your character, the character of God, character perfection. Bless us, Lord, as we study your word. But before, Lord, forgive us for where we have fallen short because we are chief of sinners. We are depraved. We are born in sin and shape and iniquity. But by your grace, by your mercy, by your kindness, you have paid the ransom so that we can be free to exalt you and to serve you and to experience the transformation of character so that we can be accepted of you. Forgive us where we fall short. Help us that, Lord, we will overcome the tendencies that tend to want us to, to sin, the cultivated and inherited tendencies. Help us that we'll apply as individuals right choice so that we can overcome sin in our daily lives. Help us, Lord, as we study your word in, an, in a spiritual, intellectual way, we shall rise to the standard of perfection where it is we will experience the outpouring of your spirit in the latter rain. Since 1888, you have made it available to us. And Lord, we are remiss. Have mercy upon us. Help us, Lord, to do all that we can to experience your spirit, the spirit of the latter rain. Bless us, Lord, as we understand what it means to truly be perfect and how, Lord, we can overcome all sin and reach that level of the 140 and 4,000. Bless all of those who are here. Lord, this is your church, the believers, who are professing and are possessing your spirit. Help us that we will grow in grace and in knowledge and in the wisdom of you in perfection. We thank you for all that you have done for us. Lord, bring in those who are not here yet. May they come to, Lord, know the truth of the plan of salvation as revealed in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you, you are God, our God, our life, the source and the origin of all things that is good and true and kind. Lord, hear our prayer, we do ask you on this Sabbath day, bless us again. In Jesus' wonderful name with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Brethren, I started, um, we were in the book, The Mystery of Three Choices, Adam's, Christ's, and Yours. And we have been reading about what it means to be an individual with the freedom of choice in Christ. So I'm just, I'm a person, I like to go over what we did before. I like chronology and I like, you know, um, following in a pattern that your mind will be able to grasp the knowledge of God. So um, I'm just going to go over some of the principles that we studied before when I was last here. And then we are going to go into the new realm, the realm of what it means to be perfect. Because there are a lot of theories, even in those who profess Christ, that you can't be perfect. Because we are here, we will always sin. We will always do wrong. We will always choose to do unrighteousness. But this is not so. The word of God reveals clearly, unequivocally and clearly that we can be perfect. So we're going to see what perfection of character is. As we start, we will go to page 54 of that book. If you want to have your electronic Bibles with the books, I hope you will be able to follow, but before I even start, let me just go over what we did before. We live in a time where 
knowledge is increased. In the book of Daniel it says, knowledge is increased and men will go through, to and fro on the earth. We are seeing a clear manifestation of that phenomenon. And we know it is nearer than we think. But Christ will never come if we are not prepared, if we do not do the work to bring in his coming. He has done his part. He continues to do his part in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. He has gone through from since 1844 the holy place where it is he gave us the ability to experience justification and sanctification. 1844, he moved to the most holy place where it is he's doing the work of the blotting out of sins while we are here on this earth. So we live in the era when God is doing the period, it's a period of time from 1844, where he's doing this work of blotting out sins, what we call, what we as Adventists, those who believe in the coming of Christ, the seventh day Sabbath, we believe that there is a pre-Advent judgment what we call the investigative judgment. And it's very, very sound and biblical, a biblical sound doctrine that it was a painful um, knowledge that the pioneer Adventists in the time of the, uh, of, uh, of the uh, Ellen G. White and, the, and well, William Miller initially, and then Ellen G. White, when it is, they have the great disappointment and had to go and peruse the Bible day and night to understand what was happening, why did not Christ, why Christ did not come in 1844. And then they came to the knowledge that Christ did not, his coming was not to the earth. He, he had moved from the holy place of the sanctuary and the, the heavenly sanctuary. He had moved from the first apartment, the holy place, into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to act as high priest. And we have that knowledge from the book of Hebrews. So he is giving us grace, he's giving us truth, he's giving us knowledge, wisdom, and understanding for us to be able to overcome all sin right now. In fact, from the time it is, man sin, he had given that, he had done that. In fact, he had made, made it available from the foundation of the world. As the Bible says, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So let me just go over the points that we had done before in this chapter, chapter nine of the book, The Mystery of Three Choices, Adam's Crisis and Yours. It was chapter, we had started. We had started chapter nine, which is, which is the chapter that deals with individual choice. I will just, I made a summary and a synopsis before I continue and then we'll see what perfection is from the, from the Bible, the biblical understanding of what it means to be truly perfect in Christ. What we have learned before, each individual has choice given to us by the second Adam. Of course, the second Adam is Christ, who has legally redeemed us from sin. Each individual has been re-given the choice to obey personally, as an individual, God, to not to sin, and it is given through the second Adam, Christ our Redeemer. Man was found guilty because he was given the unique feature of freedom of choice. As an intelligent being with the capacity to develop character. So we understand that is a unique feature that God has given unto us, which is freedom of choice. God is a God of freedom of choice. He's not a God of force. He doesn't force you to do anything because that is his nature. Okay, he has given us that feature as an intelligent being with the capacity to develop character. So the main thing with God is what? Character. Character formation. 
what is in your mind, not what is in your heart that pumps blood. The heart that the Bible refers to is not the, it's not the heart that pumps blood. The heart that pumps blood is a muscle that pumps blood throughout the whole body. When the Bible refers to heart, it means the mind of man. That's where we are intelligent, where we reason, where we understand, and so on, and where we are able to choose freely. And we saw that in Romans 5, 15 to 9. An intelligent, man is an intelligent being with the soul of freedom of choice. The animals do, don't have it. So the animals are not being saved. They don't need to be saved. It is those who have the freedom of choice who are human beings, intelligent, sentient beings that have the ability to choose. So we as intelligent beings were found guilty before God. The level of guilt depends upon the amount of light revealed and experienced. And if it is you sin without experiencing that light, the, word, the Bible uses light to mean knowledge, information, spiritual information. You are ignorant about it. God is a merciful, but when when that knowledge or that light is known, repentance should be and must be made if you are to be accepted of God. Yeah. The other point we saw in that passage that I read the last time and analyzed is that sin is the transgression of the law. Our problem here is sin. Plain and simple. What the theologians call the depravity of man. Man is depraved. All he can do is only evil and, and unrighteousness continually. And we saw, since sin is the transgression of the law, and we see it as disobedience to God, right? The law of God, what God gave on Mount Sinai, those Ten Commandments, that points out sin. It doesn't save us. The law was not made for a righteous man, but for sinners. If you know the text. Okay? And that law does not make you righteous. So we are not righteous by the law of works. But we are righteous by whom? Christ. Jesus Christ, our righteousness. Okay? Christ is our righteousness. He, he is the second member of the Godhead. When I use the term first, second, and third, I don't mean no kind of inferiority. I mean there's coexistence, co-equality with all the members of the Godhead because they have the divine nature. And that is the highest that there is. The divine nature is, the, is God himself, who is one nature, but he's revealed in the three persons of the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. So Christ is a member of the Godhead, and, and it is his work, in his peculiar work as a member of the Godhead, who who becomes incarnate, who, who relates to creation, intelligent creation. He is the one who is our savior. He is the one who is doing the work of, work of making us righteous because we are not righteous of ourselves. We do not have what is called inherent righteousness. That's why we will continually sin without Christ. No being, no intelligent being have righteousness of their own. The source of righteousness is Christ, our righteousness. The Father is righteous also because he has the nature of righteousness and the Holy Spirit. They are three persons of the Godhead. So it was only Christ who can make us righteous. We cannot of ourselves do righteousness. All our works that we do could never obtain it. That's the other point. The next one is that we looked at the process of what causes sin. We see that temptation is not sin, but yielding to it, choosing it, tolerating and cherishing it, and cherishing unholy thoughts, unholy desires, unholy feelings. And because of the first sin, we have that sinful flesh, that's the medium that the devil uses to get to our minds so that he will cause us to sin. 
No one can force an individual to sin. It is the mind that chooses it, whether you know it or not, you like it or not, really is you who choose it. That's how the mind works. Perhaps you are influenced or what have you, but you have to eschew or avoid the influence, do away with the influence, and choose the right thing. So no one forces the individual to sin. The mind chooses it. So we can as well reject the, un, the, the, the unholy knowledge, the unholy um, information that causes us or influences us through our sinful flesh to sin. As we see the example that is in Christ, who was, one, was like one of us. The other point was having sinful flesh. That was another point that we saw in this book. Having sinful flesh is not having sin. Sin is not sinful flesh. What is sin? The transgression of the law. Is sin works? Is sin deeds? Is sin deeds? Is, is the sin, is sin deeds? Church, sin is not deeds and works. The works is the manifestation of what is in the mind. Sin is, a, is the mind thing. And if you go to the book of Romans, Paul is very clear. He says, how we have the mind that is a sinful mind or a mind that is unrighteous, he calls it the carnal mind. He says the, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So that is all happening because of the first sin. We all inherited from the federal head, the representative, Adam, the first Adam, we inherited because he did it first. He is our predecessor. So, having sinful flesh is not sin. Sin is not works or deeds. Works or deeds is a manifestation that you have sin in your mind. So sin is the root of the problem. The mind problem is a mind thing. Okay? And where it is you have that carnal mind, you exalt yourself. That is the mind of the originator of sin. In First John, you will see that. He wants to exalt himself about God. I will be higher than, I will ascend. He wants to be higher than God and nobody can be higher than God. No creation can be. You can't jump species, if, if, for a, a, a biological way of saying it. You can't jump from being a creation to being the creator. That does not compute. Okay? So, sin is selfishness. It's a mind that chooses, the originator of sin chooses himself. Chooses himself as the creation. And he rejected the creator. And he believes that he can, he can operate like the creator. And what is the manifestation of his works here on this earth? Chaos and disaster and sin and annihilation problem. The mind of man is deceitful and desperately wicked of all things. That's why we are chief of sinners. So we see that that is our problem. The carnal mind. The carnal mind is the mind that is of the, of the originator of sin that causes us to sin continually until it is God puts us, puts us stop to it as we willingly choose him. And also, because we have the carnal mind when we are not, we, we don't have Christ, and we have sins that were backed up. We have sins in the past. God looks at us in our present consciousness. He looks at us in our present consciousness. That is why he has to do a thorough work of dealing with the, our mind in our present consciousness to give us justification. And um, he gives us his righteousness continually. If we abide in him, as we abide in him, to experience sanctification, it will take a lifetime. Some people never even experience it. And do another point, it is not you justifying yourself. It is not you saying, I am righteous, I am righteous, I am saved. When God doesn't say you are righteous and you are saved. The text says, it is God that justifies. 
we experience his righteousness in sanctification, and that could take a lifetime. Some people end their life and they, and they don't even have justification, much less sanctification. So they are on the broad road to destruction. They will come up in the second resurrection. And that one is the resurrection of what? Damnation. Eternal damnation. No longer being aware of God. No longer being aware of the source of life, the beauty of life, the glory of God, the holiness of God, who he says, I have not seen nor ever heard, nor have, nor have it entered into the heart of man, the things God has in store for them that love him. Amen. So we see that is our problem. The carnal mind in the present consciousness and the past sins and, and Christ is doing a thorough work. He's an efficient God. He's fit. He's efficient. He's God. He's the one who knows all things. Even before sin happened, he knows it because he's omniscient. And he made a plan. We saw there was a point in time as uh, two weeks ago I showed in the evening session, he has a perfect plan. He built a perfect uh, plan which has seven pillars. Seven is the number of perfection. Okay? So the next point we saw, choice has two basic levels from the book that we're reading right now, uh, we're going to in, into right now. Of course, the primary level is spiritual choice. To choose to, to continue growing in grace, to continue abiding in Christ, to want to know God, to surrender, to repent and turn away. True repentance is sorrow for sin and what? Turning away from it and accepting the obedience of Christ and growing in that. And as you get that knowledge in, in your mind and you start to read and study, you grow. Because when you're first justified, you were like a little child like those infants going to primary, um, primary school. And you have to learn. You come and you carry on as the children, the, 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 the infants, come to, when they come to school, they behave bad when they first come into the school. But then when they are taught, after a while they settle down nicely and they start to learn. So the church is a school. It's a school, it's a hospital, it's an, in, uh, of course, the school is an educational institute. We are supposed to be in the school of the prophets. We didn't come here to look nice and dress up and what have you, and have nothing in our heads, and we're not developing. If you look at those in the world, they have the knowledge, everything they have the knowledge of without God. And it's God who gives the knowledge. And they grow, they get the, they, they get the um, primary education, the secondary education, the tertiary education, they can have the PhD, the whatever, the DDD, the, 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 the and they, and, and they exalt in that. And we who have everything at our means, we have it freely. We have free education in Christ. God giving it to us without fail. So we should take advantage of it. We saw, so spiritual choice is the most important one. It has to do with your morality, your values, your beliefs. What you decide, when it is you learn about God and you see his character, and you see how he is? Because God is a God of mercy and long suffering and abundance in goodness and truth. And that is his character. And he's going to give you something else. He'll give you mercilessness. He'll give you badness. No, he gives you what he has. And he alone has it. Okay? So when he gives it to you and you receive it, you are experiencing, you are choosing individually to go the right road. Anybody who really desires to know because uh, we have so much, so much, what's the word, knowledge about God. The psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. So nobody has any excuse. The atheists, the polytheists, the whoever is, they are, the animists. All of these people who have all these false gods, and they have no excuse. And no tradition, no culture, no worldly knowledge will give you Christ. Christ sees it for, sees what you desire in your mind. He sees you as an individual. He knows every hair of, on our head. And he gives it to you when he sees you yearn for it. So, 
So we have this important ability to freely choose, to choose Christ, to surrender, okay? And it is Christ, Christ has already done the work for us. But we have to also do our, our work, our part, by choosing individually. It is not to just say, oh, people come in the church and they say, oh, Christ, uh, uh, we just come here and we stop choosing. They stop choosing to learn. They stop choosing to go forward. They, they, they are not following on to know the Lord. The knowledge of God is a movement in knowledge and wisdom and understanding. It is a movement. God has passed the battle from since Adam sin, right on all down to the ages, to the patriarchs, patriarchs and prophets. And we live in the day where it is we can receive the most light, the most knowledge, the most information. So let us partake of it. So, we must choose him because he did everything for us. He has, he has the title deed. He's, the God, he's holding the title deed <laughs> because he did his part. He came, he was in God as an incarnate human being in the body of a sinful man, in the body of a, in the body of sinful man, in sinful flesh. But his mind was always the mind of God. He could have sinned, but he never for one moment gave in. If he had only done that, we wouldn't be here. So we have to see the enormity of the work that Christ has done. And we have to see also the sinfulness of sin, how it is devastating. So when we see that, we would be spurred on to know more and more. And that's what Christ requires of us. And when we do that, we start to experience what is called perfection. Character perfection. He will give us his faith. He'll give us the works that come from that faith. Good faith, righteousness by faith that works. He'll purify our soul from sin. He'll give us character perfection. And that character perfection, we could grow in it. Even though you're perfect, you could grow in perfection. You always grow in perfection. It's just having God in you. Righteousness of his knowledge in you, his love in you, his holiness in you, and you can grow in him because he's ever, he's a God who is in, in eternity. He has no beginning or end. He's always uh, revealing himself in the knowledge and wisdom and understanding of who he is. And that's why we must glorify him. So the wrong way of choosing, having that spiritual choice, you can wrongly choose. And there are many who choose the wrong way, even though they are in church buildings. Because there is a true church and a false church, and there's the church building. The church building is not the church. It is just the geographical area, but we have a nice, all the different decor. But really, we come in here to study and to learn. And the church are you who accept Christ, the true church, who have the faith of Jesus Christ. Okay? And if you don't have the faith, you can be coming here and sitting down in the church and you're not learning a thing. And sad to say, a lot of us, a lot of um, members who say they are serving Christ, they follow different denominations and they have different doctrines. They are with the void of the knowledge of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. And that's why God has allowed the Seventh-day Adventism to be, to be revealed to the pioneers from William, William Miller's time, the knowledge. God always have a remnant. He will always, all those who really want to serve him in spirit and in truth, and to see that this earth is to be recreated and to have um, the, 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 the right government. And they are the ones who has uh, given us the information, pass on that knowledge to all the, oh, we have lots of information, we have yet, we even have it now, we can look at it while we sit down in church. So the believers have the, education um, provision. We have the spiritual provision to experience transformation. We have the educational division. So we can experience character perfection. So the wrong way of those who uh, say they are the church, because they are those who say, Lord, Lord, and call God and say God is theirs, but are not truly trans transformed as individuals. It is, an, an, it is as individuals that God does a work with you. Christ did his work as the federal head. He gave us the title deed. 
and we have to do the work of experiencing him. So there are those who say they will choose, they still have that self-effort without surrender, without repentance, true, true repentance and that change. And they have legalistic works, they have legal pride, but they do not have character perfection. And that's why, even us, we have to look at ourselves and say, where have we fallen short? To fall short of the glory of God is to be sin, to have the mind of sin. To fall short of God's glory is to not to, to, to stop the, the, the transformation of, chara of character perfection in your thinking and the thinking process. So we need to be revived and to be reformed. So we must look at others. We must see where they have fallen short, where they have failed. But we must make sure it is we do not repeat the mistakes of the past. The messenger of the church says, we have to be careful that we do not repeat the mistakes of those in the past. And they have made a lot of mistakes. If we didn't make mistakes, we wouldn't be here. We would still be in the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, we would overcome sin, and we would be in a new earth experiencing the joys of the glory of God. But we are still here, it's a reality. So something is not happening with us. There is no character perfection, or the growth is not there. Individuals are not acknowledging that they must, they must seek Christ, search for him, experience him, grow in him. When we get that knowledge, we will be able to experience the highest level of Christian perfection in the latter reign. Okay? There's a secondary choice. That choice is just a choice that you make. You want to buy a car, you want to buy a house, you want to wear a dress, what color, blah, blah, blah. That's it. <laughs> but the main one is the spiritual choice. And the secondary choice is not a spiritual thing. It's just a mundane thing. The next point we saw that each individual is responsible for his own sins. You are the one who chose, you have uh, your own mind, you have uh, the freedom of choice, the choice that God gives you as an intelligent being. So you are personally responsible and accountable for sin in you. That's why you must call upon God and surrender and and. and Eschew the evil and hold on to the good. Chil uh, children suffer from the sins of previous generations, we saw in that other point. They suffer the guilt, but not the punishment, unless they also participate in the sin. So let us now move on. Those are the points that we saw before. When we were reading that book, The Mystery of the Three Choices. We're going to go now to see why we need to be individually choosing Christ to experience perfection of character. And I'm going to look at the book from page 55. Page, sorry, not page 55. Page 53. If you have that book, The Mystery of Three Choices, Adam's Christ and Yours, I'm, I'm reading from page 53. I find this book is, it, it's so wonderful. This book has all the principles that I see is able to give you the knowledge of Christ. It's its present truth. We have to be established in present truth. Of course, you'll take out things all, for, uh, the knowledge that we learned before, it ties in, but you have to go along, you have to follow on to know the Lord. And it starts, it says, all true obedience comes from the heart. That heart, of course, is the mind. You want to see a text with that? Let's look at 1 Kings, chapter 3. You see how they, um, God shows it when, um, Solomon was being inaugurated as king. First Kings chapter three. 
the first day stop for three years. Let's pick up first. Solomon was very humble when he first became king. And he didn't ask for the riches, he asked for the wisdom of God. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 3 from verses, let's look, just to get context. Uh, David made a speech before, so he started verse 10. When David chose, um, sorry, Solomon chose humility. Verse 10. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Let's, let's look and see what he asked for. Seven, verse seven. Oh, let's try from verse seven. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. But I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. Do you understand with the physical heart that pumps blood? Where does understanding take place? In the mind. Okay. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart Verse 9, to judge thy people that I may what? Discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked for thyself long life, Neither has asked riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding, understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. So a lot of people don't have that, you know. They say the heart is, I mean, the heart has, you, you feel certain emotions through the blood and blood. But the real, the, 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 the core of the matter is the mind. The core of the matter, and you understand with the, with the mind, you don't understand with the physical heart. That, that massive muscle that pumps blood all throughout the body. Okay? So it says here, I'm going back to the book on page 53. It says, chapter 9, chapter 9 on page 53, chapter 9 is individual choice. All true obedience comes from the mind. You obey in the mind. It was mind work, thoughts. Where do you have thoughts? In the physical heart, in the mind. And aims, goals. So blend our minds, and sometimes they use it in a certain way, hearts, minds, and what have you. They say they're using minds, but the word hearts, they're most likely mean the emotions that come through, you know, uh, uh, the, the, um, because the mind is made up of, of uh, the thoughts, the will, the emotions, you know, and the spirit. Okay, so, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will. His will is his choice for us. And his will for us is to be what? Sanctified. Justified and sanctified. You cannot experience sanctification without first experiencing justification. That term justification just means being born again. You know? It's like, you know, you, you just got your license. You know, people believe that they just learn in the, the manual for the drive with life. And they just do it in an intellectual way and that's it. But you have the, you have to have the works, the manifestation, the experience on being on the road where they have rules. Okay? 
So you start off, and it's the only time that you see a really start is when it says you start to drive on the road. And there are rules. If there were no rules, what would happen? <laughs> you will get plenty of tickets. You're going to accidents. So rules are always there. Rules are there for our betterment. And God is the highest rule. He's the highest law. He's spirit. God is a spirit. spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit, spirit and in truth. truth. And plenty of people believe that God is matter. Matter means that something physical. Oh. Those are terms that the, 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 those who do physics and chemistry and so on. We can learn from all of those areas because all of that is what God revealed. Mm -hmm. That's knowledge that they have and they exalt in that knowledge and they reject in the, the one who is the source of that knowledge. We who know better should even be know all that. We, God made our mind is a, they, even there the scientists in the world says we are not even beginning to use our brains fully and it's a small percentage. I can't give these statistics because I don't know the statistics right now. But it's a, we are not using the brain. 90% most likely is not used. You can imagine when we're using our brains, how we'll be able to experience so much knowledge, so much enlightenment, so much wisdom. God wants wise people. God is an intelligent God. He doesn't want people who don't know and ignorant uneducated in the things of spiritual things and also the things of the world. That's why they always say, you have to go to college in the world, you have to do this, because it is important, it makes you, you know, it, you get knowledge and you grow and you have, that's how it is, you develop your character with knowledge and wisdom. But our character development is with spiritual knowledge. Okay? So, here's what, um, we, uh, we must blend our hearts and minds into conformity to, to, our, uh, no, to his will. That when obeying him, he will be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. I remember in school, you know, in, uh, in Trinidad, in um, high school, we always would line up in one morning for prayer. It's a Presbyterian school. And our school motto was, the will does it. What is the will? That's where you experience freedom of choice. And you make decisions. The will, you decide to do it. When you decide, you will do it. Okay? The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. We have to be as little children. Remember Christ told us, told us that, that? If you want to really enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be like what? Little children. So we must be obedient. Even though we are adults in this physical world, we must be children in this spiritual world. But we must not only stay children in the spiritual world, we must grow. And the growth is in the knowledge and the wisdom. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God, as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through our appreciation of the character of Christ, through our appreciation of the character of Christ, my accent might be a little different from everybody own, but listen to the thoughts of the word. Don't look at the accent. That is just through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Desire pages, page 676. Remember that the new birth conversion cannot occur without the choice of the individual. So we have a powerful tool. Everybody have it, but we are more aware of it. And we know what, what, how, why we have, should have it and how we should use it. So we have this tool here to use as individuals. John 3, 15 and 16, Revelation 22, 17. The individual must choose to be in Christ. You must choose to be where? Out of Christ. You must choose to be in Christ. 
And to what? Not only to be in him, but to stay in him. That is what we call sanctification. But if you do sin, if you happen to sin, if you didn't avoid sin, if you, uh, and we learn as we go, God, that's why God is merciful, he knows our frailties. <clears throat> Here we have an advocate with the Father. Mm -hmm. This is what you, isn't this a God to know? God. Isn't he a knowing God? Isn't he a, a, his identity is revealed? Tell mm -hmm. me all these gods who they're worshiping, all these denominations was worshiping, you, they don't even know who he is. We have a knowledge of him. And some of us really don't get it yet, you know. There's so much to know about God. If God is in his knowledge, the knowledge of God is eternity. You could imagine. We start off here. And we can know him as our God, our Father. Imagine have a, having a God, the true God, who you can know. Does that make sense? When a child uh, is away from the parents, uh, brought into the world, and they want to know who their parents are. We want to find out and search, search, search. So our parent is whom? Our original parents. Who did we, did we come from? Uh, 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 from every nation, kindred, creed, creed, and tongue and people. Who do we come from? Who do we come from? God. God. What does Paul say? God made of what? One blood. All nations to dwell upon the face of the earth. So all those who feel the racial, whatever, the discrimination, they don't know better. They have the carnal mind. They don't know. They are not aware of that knowledge, and we who know it, that's why we must have love one for the other. Whether we look, however we look, wherever we look, we, we, are, we have human nature. And even though we are human nature, we have to also, <clears throat> excuse me, acknowledge those of the animal. We are treating animals good too. And of course, you must welcome the knowledge of the uh, uh, celestial beings, the angels. They are here with us, even though they're invisible, like the wind. Are uh, they not here? Yes. A lot of people don't believe in them. The Sadducees didn't believe in the uh, Sadducees. They didn't believe that they are the angels. Okay? So, we can know God. God is knowable. He reveals himself. He's transparent. He's not sick. He's not a secret God. He is a, a, a God who reveals himself. And that is one of the most wonderful things. So we can know him. That's why we are here learning. Okay? So remember the new birth conversion cannot occur without the choice of the individual. The individual must not only choose to be in Christ, but to stay. You have to continue. He that what? endures to, to the end what the same, the same shall be saved god the father is drawing all men <laughs> isn't he wonderful he doesn't leave us alone he draws us to him he draws us to him by his holy spirit and unto christ the spirit gives the sinner the gift of repentance so it is a gift and what is a, when you get a gift, what does it mean? Did you buy it? It is without price and without what? Money or without price. It is free. And this is the most wonderful gift to get. To get the gift of the conversion, transformation, and the theologians call it justification. To be made righteous by God. Okay? The Spirit gives the sinner the gift of repentance. See, so giving us gifts. There's a text that says, the gifts and calling of God is what? Without repentance. The gifts and calling of God is without repentance. Do you know what that means? Those who didn't repent like how we do, they have gifts too. You know, you see all they have, they have um, America got talent with all the singing and the what have you. And you can do all sort of what, unique things. God gave gifts to men. We are his children and he gives us gifts. We, we are his children, he's our parent, he's our father, he's our God. He gives us gifts. And we have the gifts now. What do we have to do with ourselves? Understand what the gift is in us. Don't hide it under a bushel. But what? Make sure we get to know what it is. And not what? If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. Amen. Remember. 
Okay, so you have to stay in him. He gives gifts. Everything is free with God. Thank God. If we have to pay all this money to all of this thing, with all of this stuff, nobody will be saved. Because the only world does it. Everything is money, money, money. God is money. Money is God. Money is glory. Money is will. Money, money, money. That is the mind of the enemy. Money is matter. Money doesn't save. Money doesn't do anything for you. But it's a tool. The Bible says money is a what? A defense. You could use it, and if you have it, use it to glorify God. Use it to further the gospel. Not to exalt yourself on the earth, as many are doing. Okay? The Spirit gives the sinner the gift of repentance while drawing him to Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who brings us into Christ and who must keep us abiding in Christ. But the choice is ours. So long as we keep our minds fixed, he will keep thee in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Amen. So long as we keep our minds fixed upon Christ in faith and surrender, the Spirit's work ceases not until we fully reflect Christ's image. What is Christ's image? His character. Christ is the image of the of God, even though it is, he it seems to be different from the Father. They are co-equal in power. They have powers of deity and they have powers of morality. And that is the divine nature. That uh, that is how God is. He's a unique, special being. He's he's way we can't even begin to think who he is. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, he still reveals to us. Isn't that wonderful? Mine had uh, no. There's a text that says what. David says it in the, in the Psalms. The thoughts of God is too wonderful for him. When it is, he was so uh, abiding in Christ, he wrote one of those wonderful Psalms. And it has the principles of the faith in it for us to really learn and to grow and to develop our character. So, so long as we keep our minds fixed upon Christ in surrender, in faith and surrender, the spirit work ceases not until we fully reflect Christ's image. The whole heart must be yielded to God, or the change can never be wrought in us, by which we are to be restored to his likeness. You know, there's a doctrine, it's called docetism. They say how Christ didn't have sinful flesh like us, it's something like that. But it's not the true thing. And even in, in Adventist circles that they project that, we got to get it clear. I, for one person, I like to get it clear. I am one individual who like to get it clear. I love to dig deep. We must all love to dig deep because what do you get when you dig deep? Gold. Treasure. Treasure! Yep. <laughs> they have some, um, Shows on television, where it is, they have individuals all over America. They, they're looking for treasure below the ground, and they have to dig deep for the sapphire and for the all different kind of gems and so on. And the only way to, to, to get it, to polish it up, to get the money, that is their that is their way without God. The whole heart must be yielded to God, or the change can never be wrought in us by which we are to be restored to his likeness. By nature we are alienated from God. We are devoid of God initially. The Holy Spirit describes our condition in such words as these. Dead and trespasses and sins. The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. No soundness in it. We are held fast in the snare of Satan. And he's constantly working because he's here with us. Only tempting. He can't force us, he tempts us, and we, uh, it's when we choose, when it is, uh, the text says, when it is we are enticed and we allow it, when we dwell on it, we cherish it, then it will bring forth the sin. The cherishing of sin is what sin is, in the present consciousness. Taken captive by him at his way, Ephesians 2, 1, Isaiah 1, 5, 6, 2, Timothy 2, 26. God desires to heal us to set us free. So true freedom is when they're shouting freedom outside here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. True freedom is Christ, to be free from sin. 
and then you will get peace. So all the peace that they're talking about Israel and, and, and uh, uh, war, they, they always ask talking peace and it's continual war. It will always continue like that. It's only when Christ comes that will experience peace, the Prince of Peace. And it's only you now, when you have Christ in you, you will experience the peace of Christ. You will experience Sabbath rest, Sabbath peace. And peace, I learned this, peace is the continual thought of the knowledge of God in your heart. When something is working properly, when your mind is working, you experience peace. It's not burdened, it's not stressed. So those who are truly in Christ should be the most peaceful of beings. And we, we, should, uh, we reflect the image of Christ because he's the Prince of Peace. But since this requires an, an entire transformation, a renewing of our whole nature, we must yield ourselves wholly to him. The warfare against self is the greatest battle. So our battle is our self. That's the greatest battle. Self that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God, requires a struggle. When something is really worthwhile, you have to struggle for it before you attain it. But the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. The government of God is not as Satan would make it appear, founded upon blind submission and unreasoning control. It appeals to the intellect and the conscience. Come now and let us reason together is the Creator's invitation to the beings he has made, Isaiah 118. God does not force the will of his creatures. He cannot accept an homage that is not willingly and intelligently given. A mere forced submission would, would prevent all real development of mind of character or character. It would make man a mere automaton, a robot. Such is not the purpose of the creator. He desires that man, the crowning work of his creative power, shall reach the highest possible development. He sets before us the height of blessing to which he desires to bring us through the, his grace. He invites us to give ourselves to him that he may work his will in us. It remains for us to choose whether we will be set free from the bondage of sin to share the glorious liberty of the sons of God. And this is taken from Steps to Christ 43 and 44. Christ is ready to set us free from sin, but he does not force the will. And if by persistent transgression, the will itself is wholly bent on evil, and we do not desire to be set free, made free, set free, if we will not accept his grace, what more can he do? We have destroyed ourselves by our determined rejection of his love. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your heart. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Hebrews 3, 7, 7. Steps to Christ, page 24. When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. Sinful thoughts are put away. Evil deeds are renounced. Love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness, and the countenance reflects the light of heaven. No one sees the hand that lifts the burden or beholds the light that descends from the courts above. The blessing comes when by faith the soul surrenders itself to God. Then that power which no human eye can see creates a new be being in the image of God. Desire page 173. Many are inquiring, how, can, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt and control by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pleasures weakens your confidence in your sincerity. To be sincere doesn't mean because you, can, you can be sincerely wrong. But it's good to be sincere. You want to do it, you will. And causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. 
And the whole thing is that you have to come to him as you are. You can't change yourself. So you can't wait until I, I'll change myself. No way. You have to come to him if you really want change. When you need to, uh, what you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man. The power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to men. It is theirs to exercise. You cannot but you cannot but you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will he will then work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with him. Steps to Christ, page 47. It should be very clear from the ongoing quotations that a person can become born again before that person's mind is mature enough to intelligent, to choose intelligently and willingly to surrender to Christ. This absurdity, this shows the absurdity. Again, let me just read that thought. It should be very clear from the ongoing quotations that a person cannot become mature become born again before that person's mind is mature enough to choose intelligently. So those whose mind are already mature, what do they have to do? Teach those who are coming behind them. That's why the parents must teach the children. Train the child in the way of the Lord, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Okay? To choose intelligently and willingly to surrender to Christ. And this shows the absurdity of infant baptism. And you know who teaches that? Babylon, which is over the very pits of hell. They have so much What's the word the Bible uses? The Bible uses, let me, let's look and see what Babylon does teach. Let's look at Revelation chapter 17. They're teaching infant baptism. They're teaching sacraments. They're teaching vestments. They're teaching immaculate conception. They have a string, lots. They're teaching, it works, works, works without the knowledge of God. Is it chapter 17 or 14? Yes, chapter 17. Here it is. She's the woman, the harlot. A, 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 a church with Eve. Well, well. Let's read from verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit upon the wilderness, and I saw a woman. Of course, the woman is, represents the church. Set upon the scarlet ball colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, see, blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was arrayed, she's a harlot, she's a prostitute, she's a whore, and nothing good coming from that, okay, upon, full of names of blasphemy, having seven, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and she's decked off with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup. The Vatican is the only place, is the only government within a government. And it's a theological government. The seat of the papacy is a continuous seat. The office of the papacy, and that's why you have different popes. Okay? Babylon, here with her. And upon her head, no, sorry. Okay. And having a golden cup in her hand full of what? Abominations. Abominations and what? Yes. Filthiness of a fornication. <laughs> and upon her forehead was written, a name written, what? Serious. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And hear what she do. And I saw the woman in this church from, from, what is the year? The Dark Ages. You want to know the year, the period that they, that they take away the knowledge? Let me hear you say the year. 38. 538 BCB, no sorry, ACB after Christ's birth, to 1798, she take away the knowledge upon the face of the earth, and she she drained the blood of the saints. And you know one of them who was with them in the Reformation, uh, Martin Luther himself, he said, you know what? The, 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 the seat of the papacy is above the very pits of hell. And I saw, but they have a whole channel, man, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. 
There's one where she says, have you unclean an evil spirit? Where is that text? Who can tell me where that text is? Revelation 18.5. Let's look at it. What see what you're doing. And this is spiritual information here that you have to understand it. And if you're a baby in Christ, we, have, we can explain to you later. But... Uh, we, verse 2. Revelation, yeah. And he cried, uh, uh, the angel coming and showing on the light in the world with the glory. This is the one, the three angels' message. Uh, God is going to give his glory. Huh? Going God is going to give his glory to reveal all this evil. Revelation 18, 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying what? Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. There's a meaning behind those falling, you know. First she fall when? We won't go into that. And it's become the habitation of what? Devils. Devils and the whole of every? False. False spirit in a cage of every? Unclean. Unclean and hateful bird, you see? All that is false doctrine, evil. All sorts of practices and traditions and culture and that causes men to be away from the glory of God and the righteousness of God, the character of God, character perfection. And she has all sorts of, um, she really have, she, this church is worldwide, it's universal church, that's why Catholic is universal. And she has all sorts of subsidiaries, uh, they have what, the different nuns and the different thing and the cloisters, mm -hmm. and behind those closed doors, abominations are happening, sad to say, there's still, there are those who could still repent. But they love what they, uh, they love all the pomp and pageantry of Rome. There's a book called The Vatican Billions. When you read that, the people with the most money on the earth, priceless, which is when you go, when you go to the, I understand, I heard one of the people, they see the, all these awesome, we call it cathedrals, with all these different artistry and artwork by what, by Michael, Michelangelo. And it is a place that is unclean and hateful and they glorify because they've seen all these wonderful things. They take the money of the peoples of the earth and they build up this government. That's how the devil is using the, uh, this church. It is Babylon, the church that took away the knowledge. That, that This is the church that thinks to change what? Times and laws. If you read, what it is, is it called the Dewey Version? They do a version. When you look at the commandments, guess what they leave out? Four. They leave out the, the fourth commandment. And, in, and, and it's, a, it's a church with only idolatry. Icons. <laughs> there are those who are called iconoclasts and they like to break it up. I would, I, what's his name? Gideon was a person, he was a, a, a man who was an iconoclast. He broke down all the, in the groves, he broke down all the, 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 the idols. Mm -hmm. We have to be what? I can't class. I think you'll have to bring a dictionary next time. Anyway, so this is a church that is filled with false doctrine, filled with traditions and practices and cult real evil, false doctrines. Thank God we have the true church, the knowledge of who the true church is. The true church are those who have the tes testimony of Jesus Christ, who are to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. The faith and the testimony of Jesus Christ. It should be very clear. Right? So they are the ones who practice infant baptism. I'm finished with that aspect of the book. And let me just look now and show you how um, God reveals for you to choose to experience character perfection. It is possible. It is possible to experience character perfection. It is easy to be saved and not to be lost. So we must be concerned with our education in Christ. Okay, let's look at some text that show you what is character perfection? Is it a perfection of the flesh? Is it via works? Can we be perfect in this world? Yes, yes we can be perfect. So let's look at some text. Let's look at Genesis. You have to open your Bibles because we're going to see some text. And that is what will give us an informa the information, the spiritual information, to show us that this is true and real and it can happen, it's possible, and we can be saved and we can grow and we can be perfect. Genesis 17 1. What does it say? Now I'm asking you all to help me to read. Anybody who is willing can say it. Genesis chapter 17. 
verse 1. And when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. Be thou perfect. The perfection there is not of the flesh or in works. It is the perfection of character. The mind perfection. Let's look at 1 Chronicles 29, 19. Oh, I think we read that. We were um, in 1 Kings 3, um, 12. But we can read in 1 Chronicles 29, 19. 1 Chronicles 29, 19. Anybody who wants to read can read. And give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart. By commandments, my testimonies, and thy statutes, and to do all these things, and to build the palace for the which I have made provision. You see, when you have a perfect heart, what you will do? Keep the commandments. Keep commandments. And I can say this in my personal experience. Why I came to Christ? Initially, I was an evangelical. I went to a, a crusade. I did my with the carnal man. You do evil continually. But then I had an experience and I said, you know what, I want to know what's going on. Why is my family so dysfunctional? Why everybody, not only my family, a lot of people, what's going on? I always had questions in my mind. And I decided to go to this, um, this crusade and I became a Christian, thank God. But while I was there, you know what they say? No law, no Sabbath, reject Sabbatarianism, they call it. But when I thank God, eh, I was able to find a book, a Bible. At the back of the Bible had, it was written by HMS, uh, I think Richards. Like HMS Richards, and at the back have studies. Because they were saying, you must only read the Bible, no other book, no other book. Mm. And I'm an avid reader, so I said, yeah. So I got this Bible, and I'm reading at the back, and I'm seeing all this wonderful knowledge, and I'm seeing law, 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 everything is law. I said, well, how it is, the Sabbath is, a, is a, a one of the laws. Why is it saying no law? We're not under law. We're under what? Grace. Grace. Grace is the kindness of God. If God is kind to you, he wants you to obey him by keeping his laws. But he want, you can't keep it of yourself. He wants to give you his mind, his righteousness for you to keep it. That's the, proce the process, the procedure. You can't keep it of yourself. If you only keep it for yourself, and that's what Rome does. That's what Babylon does. Works, works, work. They believe in charity. And they're using charity to make money. And they cage, not only, I just have to say this too. They are the habitation of sodomy. The habitation of The Lord knows when I, 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 I'm preaching this gospel, they would want to kill me. <laughs> because I'm ready to preach this gospel. God will give me the endurance and the faith and what have you because I like to call it as it is. If I see it's, a, uh, it's working, it's still, it's have a flat feet. I, I call it a dog a dog, a dog a dog. I want to call it, but I, I will call it as God would want me to have me to call it. But listen, there are those who thank God for the American, for the, the, the knowledge of freedom of government, republicanism, where it is we still have freedom of worship, freedom of movement, freedom of speech and laws, we are ruled by laws here. That's why we are a litigious society. We are ruled by laws, but people take advantage of the laws. Thank God for these civil laws. Otherwise, there'll be chaos. Everybody will be doing their own thing. And there'll be what you call mass destruction. Who feel they're better than who and what happens. So thank God, laws are important. Civil laws and the highest law, the most important law is the spiritual law, God with spirit. Christ the Father and, and the Spirit, they are the, a God, they are the persons of the Godhead, they have the nature of God, they are the one who gives the laws. God is a law giver. That's why he gave us the commandments, we have it here, you know, to show that we're in sin. He wants to see, show us. That's why he was able, um, when he showed, uh, and I'm, I'm truly understanding his character in the light of what is happening according to his character. And we, are we are those who believe in the character of God. God is a merciful God. He is not the destroyer, uh, destroyer. God doesn't destroy, sin destroys. And it's a spiritual thing, okay? The destruction happens because of your, uh, uh, your, you are, the term is, you are spiritually rejecting God. 
when you don't have the mind of God, you are spiritually unrighteous. You are, you are. And if it is you stay in that, when, when God order, God allows the civil government to execute you, it's not He who causes it; it's you who the sin that has caused it and the sin that you hold on to. When you're experiencing spiritual death, and God sees that and you, you no longer want to serve Him, He allows whatever it is for you to experience the civil, uh, the physical death. So the spiritual death is the worst one. That is the main thing in the eyes of God. Physical death is just the death of the body, but the real death is the what? Spiritual death. You're spiritually dead when you don't have God. And the, I, I, I'm seeing that that is tied into the character of God, and God does not destroy it. It's sin that destroys. You, as you study it and we learn, you get more and more information, more light. Okay, let's look at Psalm 37, verse 37. Anybody can read Psalm 37, verse 37? Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for, for the end of that man is peace. You know, I, I like to um, have everybody interact. And if one, uh, somebody has already read, allow somebody else to read, and everybody should open their mouth and say something on the Sabbath day. If it's to read a text and to imbibe something. Okay? So those who already read, let somebody else who didn't read, read. Okay? Mark what? The perfect man. Mark the perfect man. What kind of man is that? He's perfect. He's perfect. And the end of him? Peace. Is peace. Psalms 18.30. Psalms 18.30. For God is ways perfect, the word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. If God is perfect and he gives us his character, would it be what? Imperfect? His perfect okay. character perfection. Ezekiel 28, 15. Ezekiel 28, 15. I was perfect in my ways from the day that I was created. So iniquity was found in me. Who is this being that has been talked about? Lucifer. He was what? Perfect in character. And he had freedom of choice. And I see why um, why it is freedom of choice. God gives it as a, a feature that he gives that because he himself has it. And when it is a person, since it's when a person, when it is the uh, intelligent being chooses, to serve himself and not the creator and can't keep themselves. So he chose to serve himself because there's nobody higher than God, no other being higher than God but God. God is God above God above God. It's only God. Anything above God is God. And everything is, so God is what absolute, he's the highest being. He's the super being. And we are the relative, we are, you know, we are the creation, we are the mat matter and creation. Okay, so he's perfect. He will give us his perfection. And that's how he is. Matthew 5, 48. This is a beautiful text. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Amen. He's, he's telling us what? Be ye perfect. Even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Galatians 3.3 3. Galatians chapter 3 verse 3. This is Paul talking to the Galatians here. They were practicing a lot of sin in all different forms and fashion. And they, were, uh, and they had gotten rid of it, but then it's, they, they continue. And you, they, you could, if you become perfect and start off in tran uh, being transformed by God and you don't continue, you'll fall back in your old ways and it'll, it'll be ten times worse. Seven, how much times? Ten times worse. Anybody who leaves the truth and go back, it's very hard to get back because they'll be worse. Than, and they'll be the, those who are in the world, they will be worse than those in the world because. You would have already known God and reject and turn 
and they would have certain knowledge. So, Paul is admonishing the Galatians. What is he saying? Anybody who didn't read? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Amen. The begun in the spirit, and this is where the spirit is, where character is formed. The Holy Spirit gives you, gives your spirit, the inner essence of your being, in your mind, where you form character. He gives you perfection. So perfection is in your mind, it is not of the flesh. the flesh. And this very book shows us exactly what, how the mind is made up. If you look at page four, you see they have a beautiful diagram. The spirit is the very core of who you are, where your character is formed. And then you have your intellect, your emotions, and your will or your freedom of choice. That's in the mind of men. Let's look at Colossians 1.28. Anybody who didn't read, who can read? Colossians 1.28. Anybody who didn't read, all those at the back. Um, young Marin, you can read if you want to. Anybody who didn't read can read. Colossians 1, 28. Who did not read? One more preach. One in every man, and the teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfectly Christ. Amen. You warn, and we preach, you warn, but did they hear you forget? Teach every man in all what? Wisdom, that he may present what? Every man, every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter. 4 verse 13. Before Colossians and Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13. I want to hear different people's voices in here. I want to hear your voices. Because anybody who didn't read can read can, if, uh, Ephesians 4 13. I'm employing you. I want you to choose. Person who didn't, anybody who didn't read can read for me. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4 verse 13. You come to church to read and to study. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4 13. Mm -hmm. Amen. Till we come in the mm -hmm. unity of the faith and of the Knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness in Christ. Second Timothy three seventeen. Second Timothy three seventeen. Second Timothy three seven seventeen. Is there three seventeen? Yeah. yeah. And the first was Timothy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anybody who didn't read, I'm employing you. I'm asking you. I'm requesting you. Okay. I want to hear your voice. Second Timothy three seventeen. Someone who didn't read before. Somebody who could, could read because the others are reluctant. Anybody else can read? That the man of God is what? Amen. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And this is, let's look at Psalm, let's look at Romans 3.8. 
Romans 3.8. What does it say? No, 
But when it is your sin and, you, and you, 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 uh, you're not going on to perfection and you are, some sin is there, so you need to come out of the condemnation. You need to, you need to what? Reject the condemnation and eschew the condemnation, the curse. And you need to always be in the righteousness of Christ. And for you to do that, you must be always abiding. Let's look at Psalm 19. That's the last. I mean, all read it. Psalms 19. Here it goes. Read it with me. Yes. Just a minute. Just now. It's not Psalm 19. Sorry. It's Psalm 119. That is the text. Yeah, Psalms, uh, let us read it. This is what the Sabbath is for, to be filled with the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding of God. So that you can go out there and say, you know what, I learned what character perfection is. Psalms 119, not the whole, whole thing. Let us just, sorry, I didn't mean it. it's a long psalm. It's a, I think it's the longest psalm. 150. Is it the longest? Hundred fifty-two, hundred seventy-six. What is this? Isn't that something? Is it that? Psalm nineteen verse seven. The law of the Lord is perfect and wisdom. Psalm nineteen verse seven. So why did I say hundred nineteen now? Isn't that something? Yeah. But Psalm nineteen, hundred nineteen, have it too. But that is the one. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so Let's read that. Read Psalm nineteen, everybody. Sorry about that. Psalm nineteen. Psalm nineteen. We're reading the whole for this. The whole charm of the psalm. We read together. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and is circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing from thereof. The law of the Lord is converting the... What law is this? The spiritual law. God, who is the lawgiver, converts you. He justifies you. He's the one who gives righteousness. He makes you a new creature and he makes you stay in that if you willingly surrender and abide in him. Let's continue the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant one, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Any questions? Not too much because time is of uh, fast spent and I I will allow you a few because I am another person. We have to have a break and so on. So anybody have any questions? Yes, Brother Stephen. Uh, three very quick points. Um, we talk, I think we had a earlier about the justification that man receives. We need to understand clearly the, the difference between justification and sanctification. All men and all women, the entire humanity has been justified by the sacrifice and the life of Christ. The issue is, is that not all people 
I accept the justification, and therefore they remain in that condemnation. Those who then accept the justification and continue to accept that truth that Christ has redeemed us from the sin of shame and has brought us up into newness of life, then continue to experience the sanctification of God to be made perfect by beholding his life. And that's why Paul says that as we continue to behold the character of God in Christ Jesus, that we are then transformed. So every man, whether he knows it or not, has been legally justified. Amen. He has a title deed. He has, he has gotten the title deed. He has the peace. He provides the salvation universally for everyone. Everyone, every, all, whosoever will may come. He provides that. If there's a situation going on the way it is, you know, um, uh, for land and for house, there's a, there's a, a, a usurper in, in a family who wants to take away all the land and the house. And the children, other children who are entitled to the land. But hear what? And he went again, the letters of administration, the letters of administration, if it is, it is passed on according to the civil law, to um, the person who's entitled, if it is there's a marriage, the father, the, 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 the owner is the father, and uh, when the father dies, the, 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 the mother gets it. And then you have children, and it's, everything of order is a passing down. So they have six children in the family, and one of them want to take everything. And when it is found out, um, he makes a title deed. He gets a title deed, which is the mother already has the title deed. But you do have the letters of administration according to civil law. The title deed is the deed that you legally have it, but you don't have it yet. When I say so, you have it, but you uh, 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 we, we have the title deed, but we have to uh, experience it. It's like a, an, also it's like a will. Uh, she make a will, uh, you know, he gets her to make a will saying that he must have the title deed. But the title deed is also the will according to the word of God, I think. God gives his will, his will is the title deed that he already provides salvation by what he has done from the foundation of the world. And when he literally come here and did the work of experiencing death, experiencing second death. So he gives us that provision. It's already there. We are legally, we are, we are legally have it. Now we have to do our work to attain it by experiencing him, by doing our work to experience him. But going back to the point about the civil um, situation, he gets the mother to make a will saying he, he wants everything, he has his title deed, but he has to go and get the letters of administration, it must be filed. And what they do in the civil world, they allow you 30 days to reveal it on the papers to advertise it, so anybody else who has who entitled it could say, well, no, not only you. And it was gotten just in time, just a day before, it was found out what he did. And there is something in the law that says, you could stop it. There's something called the caveat. So stop it! Because he's a usurper. He wants to get every day. And to put him in court now for everything to be revealed. And that's what's happening here. The devil <laughs> has the title. He wants to take the title deed from He served the title deed from Christ when it is he brought Adam to sin. He got the earth. He got everything on the earth. Of course, he got the man to follow him. And he here on the earth, he thinks this is his. He created. You know, but Christ come now and he, mm -hmm. he come and he give us the title deed. But he cannot, we cannot experience it until it is what? We do the work to get it. And the work to get it is what? To experience what? Justification and sanctification so that we can exalt him and should reveal and in, he's up there in the courts of heaven and he's showing that information well, when he went up after it is he was um he resurrected everybody's seeing there's a court going on there and they're looking at it because the problem here on this earth is a is for the whole universe the highest one of the highest creation uh, the highest creation an angel to, um uh, uh, reject god and come and take up uh, take one of god's uh, territory and say no, God government is no good. And he in charge. And look at what he does here. Destruction. Destruction and disaster and mayhem and catastrophe and everything. He, his government is not a good government. So we must vote for the government of Christ. 
okay? And they, they have seen the work that Christ has done. And Christ has, has continued, continues to work in, in the high priest. He's doing the last aspect of the will. When he said it is finished on the cross, it was not finished, you know. It was finished, that aspect of it. But in his resurrection, he has to go and do the work now. The legal work, he got to give us a legal title deed. And now he has to do the work of blotting out, giving us grace, all those who are alive, and so on. And then eventually blot out our sins. That is a total eradication of sin. He's a thorough, efficient, fit, capable God, the true God, the only God, the highest God. Amen. All the gods of the earth, all of the gods of the nations are idols, but he is the creator of heaven, and the true God is the creator. If it is all of them professing their God, but all the denominations say, what did your God create? What did your God do to save? He doesn't only create, he recreates. That's what we are experiencing, what? Recreation, being transformed to get back what it is we have lost. Our mind that was supposed to be in God. We are, God is our father. God is our parent. When the, our, our physical parents give us up, who will take us up? God. So... That's how it goes. Yeah, I have, I have uh, three quick points. The first is anyway. Um, the second is in regards to Romans 1 20 when he says that the invisible things of God okay, are clearly seen in the things of this world, those things that are visible to man's eyes, so that, as you finish with, without excuse. And many times we label the atheists and the scientists and other religions there. But remember, God is also speaking to us as well. Amen. Amen. Because what is one invisible thing of God? His character, his love. You cannot necessarily see love. It is something that is experienced through that. So that when we see the perfection of God, we cannot, as God showed him who said that, you cannot be perfect. Those who argue, who are professed Christians and say that you cannot be perfect, the invisible things of God that are seen in this world reveal that there is perfection, that there is order, and none of God's creatures can say that that is not the case. Amen. Because God even reveals that Amen. within his own creation. And that's the last point you spoke about um, iconoclasm later. Um, earlier, that is simply the harping upon images. So if there's anything, you might want to be a anti-iconoclast because um, Martin Luther, when Martin Luther had died, uh, there was this taking up of taking the image of Martin Luther and putting it in yeah. German houses. And people thought that this was what would save them. This mm -hmm. was more idolatry. They still do. They still do. They have people this in is, homes with statues and all sorts of stuff. This was more idolatry than it was anything good. So, if anything, maybe you might want to be anti iconoclast than being iconoclast. Amen. So, that is what Gideon was in using your example. Yes. He was anti iconoclast. He was anti iconoclast. Iconoclast is when it's the breaking of the images. Uh, I know iconoclast is harping upon images and seeing some important exalted images. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Woman, woman is iconoclast. We must be anti against the iconoclast. <laughs> um, I stand corrected. Um, okay. Idolatry. Mm -hmm. but let me say this first. Idolatry is spiritual idolatry. You all get that? Mm -hmm. <coughs> idolatry. Mm -hmm. I with the I I D O I D O L A T R Y. Idolatry. You worshiping of iconoclast is spiritual adultery. And when you are when you have spiritual adultery, you do have you devoid of God. Anything that is you not have of God. spiritual debt. Mm -hmm. no, I'm saying anything that is not of God. Yes, yes. Yes, Brother John. Yes. When Christ came the first time, it was announced. And then he came. All right, John said uh, there's one who's who's, who's, before, who's coming before or, um, after me. Who is before me? Mighty and all Mighty that. Mighty. Yes. Now, the second coming now has been announced by, you know, other people. And then, what, and then they have been, you know, people have been disappointed in that he hasn't come. Can you explain that? There's a book that is called Christ Coming in the Name People. The carnal mind will say, oh, they always, this church, people, they always go to church and they always say Christ is coming and he never comes. Peter talks about it. Um, why? You have the carnal mind, that's one aspect of it. 
But now those who are supposed to be believing in the coming of Christ and supposed to be doing the work to believe in his coming is doing it because you're not getting with character perfection. It is character perfection which will give you um, sinlessness or sin freeness. There's a term sin freeness, free from sin, which is real freedom, spiritual freedom is the highest freedom. That will bring in the coming of Christ. So there are scoffers who say, there are scoffers. It will happen. And it will happen because we we have to make it happen. God is dependent upon us. That's the work that we are supposed to do. And we are failing. The organization since 1888 experienced a, 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 get the, a get a revival and reformation through the 1888 message and we check it. But there's always a remnant will continue and get. There will be. And Brother, Brother John, I want to be among the one of them who will bring in the coming of Christ. I, 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 this aging is a good thing for us to repent of sin in the time being. But I want to see the coming of Christ when he comes. That's my hope. Christ is my hope. His coming is my hope. I see the things of the world is what foolishness unto me. And that's why I'm seeking he first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he got everything else unto me. Unto us. So we are delaying his coming when it is we do not put away sin. And uh, if you notice what happened in the time of the early reign in the upper room, everybody was in the unity of the faith. They exalted Christ. They had character perfection. That's why the Spirit was poured upon them. And they were able to bring in thousands in the early church. We are in a modern day and we, we, we can do it. We have we have the tools, the means, and the way we fall to do it. So we have to make sure. We have to put away the things of this world, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, and focus on doing the work of God. We have to, and let me tell you, it's not only on the Sabbath day. We have to be always studying. We should have a school where it is we teaching young people to go, to experience God, you know, a, a school for every day as a college of uh, a what? school of the prophet. Where is it? I I am only one person I can do it. I hope by the grace of God I'll be able to do something by his grace. I'm calling upon him to help me to be able to do something to do this. I am sad that what is happening, I want Christ to come. Okay. And I, you have to preach the gospel. When you have it, you will not sit down and remain quiet. You will watch. Be dynamic and you'll be active and you'll be preaching the word of God. But you've got to, you have to get it down pat. You've got to have it. It has to be taught. No, no, it has to be taught. You know, and uh, when it is, you receive it. And just how sin is contagious, everybody becoming, again, everybody becoming um, a sodomite. Everybody, everybody, it's contagious. Righteousness is more contagious. Where sin abounds, Grace that's much over. That's it. Let's pray. I'll ask three people to pray.